I uh, went to prison uh, for securities fraud in the 1980s, much to my shame, uh, albeit well-deserved. I was one of those guys who, who deserved it. And uh, did 87 months in federal prison. That is more time than Michael Milken, Leona Helmsley, and uh, Nick Leeson combined. I was one of those CEOs. I was the first of the bad CEOs. Before there was Enron, there was me. Lennar Corporation. It, you would think that a company on the New York Stock Exchange, the second largest builder in the country, would have the utmost in integrity and ethics and be above reproach in their business dealings. And Lennar, uh, I can safely say, I had never found anybody worse than me. And you know you've hit rock bottom when you are likened to me. latest figures show that we have over 300,000 homes in America being foreclosed every month. Over 2.5 million homes have been foreclosed in this country. We have an unemployment rate of 9.5 percent. People are walking their mortgage because that's the only way out of this entire mess. My wife and I, we go out at nighttime, ride around, and about 75 percent of the homes out here, you'll see midnight moose, and they're just leaving them. They're just walking away from them because you can't sell them for the price that you bought them for. There's a direct link between the lack of protection to the consumer and the home that is underbuilt, overpraised, and oversold, and the collapse, financial collapse that we have in this country today. The day we first started looking at homes, um, we liked the hometown country atmosphere of Hutto, and we thought this would be a great place to retire. You're out there looking at homes, and you see this is a new subdivision, brand new homes, and you go in and talk to the salesperson, and of course this model is, is beautifully decorated, the house looks great, um, and they tell you that you can move into this house with little or no money down. Lennar made it extremely easy in buying their homes. They had an incentive that it, their homes had everything. Lennar representatives basically told me I would get additional discounts on the home if I used their lender. They go in and, and they, they close on the loan. They sign a bunch of papers. Of course, they don't read everything they're signing. Uh, they simply want to get this process over and get into their new home. Lennar told me that it would be basically a waste of time to get a third party inspector out here uh, because they had already had the home inspected and everything was up to par. It would basically be a waste of money on my part. And then at some point after that, uh, they become aware of some of the problems. The very first day that we moved into our home, we noticed multiple problems, among which there was a knocking in the living room wall, and that was resulting from loose pipes that were not fastened down. Within the first couple of months, um, we started having problems. Um, the driveway cracked in half, uh, nails started popping out of the sheetrock. We had constantly shingles on the roof coming off and lifting up. We had shortages, which caused us to lose our uh, big screen TV and a computer. They're not poltergeists, they're not imaginary. They're real construction defects, which um, will, will have their, their source either in, in one of two areas. They'll either be emanating from uh, poor construction or and or uh, expansive clay soil. We had uh, problems with big, large holes in our yard, and Lennar had to keep coming out for a couple of years and bringing out truckloads of dirt to fill in the holes. It caused the fence to fall down. In some cases, the noises uh, become uh, louder and louder, and the walls begin to shake. And it's all through here. It's real bad in the, in the master bedroom and in the dining room and in our former dining room, it's the same thing. And they, and they come out here, they repair these, and they don't even last maybe three months. And then they start cracking again and peeling and 
Sooner or later, you'll have paint all over everything. And we contacted the Lennar representative uh, and asked them to take a look at it. And uh, it was disclosed that they were having numerous uh, complaints. They were repairing a lot of the homes in the neighborhood. Your gut feeling about the whole process, it goes from concern to alarm. The builder has come out and uh, quite often will profess uh, you know, surprise uh, at what's going on. Um, they don't understand, but uh, they'll do the best they can to fix the problem. Lennar said they were doing some repairs in the homes and we questioned the uh, repair process and what was actually the source of the problems. Kind of got some conflicting answers from them. Well, Lennar will come in and patch cracks. They will address the superficial problem. First they said that the sheetrock was uh, nailed on improperly. Then they sent out a report that said the pre-existing year, the weather, there was a lot of rain and there was soil movement. If your foundation is moving, if your foundation is experiencing heaving and contracting, we have to understand that this soil out there is some of the most expansive in the entire country. When a drought occurs, it contracts uh, greatly when there is a lot of rain, it expands. I was furious, my husband was too, because we are in our retirement ages. We didn't want to um, have a lot of problems with a home. That's why we bought one that was new. And had we known that it was on expensive clay soil with arsenic contamination, we would have never purchased the home at all. We buy our home from Lennar, we move in, um, our kids play outside like every others would, uh, they're playing on the dirt. They could be being exposed to arsenic and, and, and high levels of that and it's very, very worrisome Both to me, my wife, and, and um, we're kind of afraid of uh, what's actually out there. This is not the American dream. The problem exists because under the Brownfield Act, which is a federal law that was passed in 2001, a developer can buy contaminated property. They can be put on the honor system to do cleanup. They then can sell that property to a builder. So the builder has no duty to disclose to the homeowner um, about the, the contamination. And the, the homeowner, of course, finds out about that after the fact, and they're stuck with a home. This is, uh, this is a law that simply invites, frankly, disaster to homeowners. On the dates that they said they were removing the soil, remediating the land, I uh, looked up on TerraServer to look for a footprint of uh, activity going on on the land, and uh, the land was undisturbed during the time that they reported to the TCEQ that the uh, land was being remediated. It clearly uh, looked like um, a lot of the documentation was not adding up with what um, I was seeing using satellite imagery. So anyone doing due diligence on the property out here would never know that it was part of a VCP, a voluntary cleanup procedure. Um, it was a brownfield. Um, no one would have any idea. There's no state agency overseeing saying you cannot send, sell this piece of land which you know to be polluted without putting a deed restriction. If Lennar sells land such as that, then the injured person can sue Lennar for all the damages. And if the children get sick for playing on land that Lennar should have notified them about, then Lennar is liable for all the damages. And if someone's sick for years, then they have to pay for all their care. And that's supposedly the deterrent. In Texas, there is absolutely no requirement that a builder be licensed to build the largest purchase that a consumer will make in their lifetime, that is their home. Until September 1st of 2009, there were only three requirements for registration, which is not licensing. 
One, you, a builder had to be 18 years of age. Two, they had to be legally in the country. And third, they had to sign a paper that said that they were trustworthy. Those are the requirements that existed prior to September 1. Now there are none. I think that if a person comes in to buy a home, they should be told everything. They should be shown the proofs of these homes being built, you know, built perfect, built right. If you buy a home, that's just like if you buy a car. If your car breaks down and you have so much trouble with it, what's going to happen? You'll take it to a lemon law and they'll buy the car back from you. You know, they have to. That's state law. But it's not here in the state of Texas. You cannot make the buyers buy your home back that's coming down, falling down behind you. I asked Lennar to buy the home back, and they have refused. They told me explicitly, Lennar does not buy back homes. We build them. If there's a problem with a mortgage, if a mortgage is written between a, a land developer such as Lennar and a homeowner, and the mortgage fails because the homeowner uh, loses so much money that they want to walk away from the home or because the land is polluted and the medical bills caused by the pollution cause the home buyer not to be able to make the mortgage payment, then the financial loss is passed on to the owner of the derivative. So there's no deterrent. The company that wrote these bad mortgages can go ahead and write more bad, bad mortgages. In the past, they would lose money and they would go out of business or their shareholders would tell them they have to stop and get new management. The people who live in the Legends of Hutto and, and the other subdivision uh, operated by Lennar, we have found mold problems that really harm people. Uh, for example, uh, there's a lady over in Hutto in one of the subdivisions whose husband uh, is a, a Vietnam veteran who has trouble with his lungs. And uh, he had an Agent Orange experience during the Vietnam War. And so anything like mold affects him very quickly. Mold started getting into the windows and uh, we had mold contamination throughout the home. It was coming up on the side of where the windows was installed. The most toxic mold that was in any of the rooms was in our first bedroom. It was causing problems with my lungs where I could just barely breathe on the inside of the house and I was rushed to the hospital uh, various of time and I had to have be on life support where they was physically pumping oxygen into my lungs. On June 17th of 2009 of this year, my husband and I met with Sean Chandler. Sean Chandler is the Texas president for Lennar. During that meeting, which lasted over two hours, Sean Chandler told me that the chances of HUD coming back and doing something really bad to Lennar was very great. It is falsifying a government document. The government document that Sean Chandler was referring to is this form. It's a HUD form 92541. It's required on all FHA and VA loans and it explicitly asks certain questions among which is the home built on expensive clay soil. On my document, Lenore put an X under no for everything, for including that it was not built on expensive clay soil. At the bottom of the document on the next page, it states that false certification could lead to fines and it's a felony. That's a tragedy, not just because of a forged HUD document where Lennar literally said on a government document, is this project home built on expanding soil? Yes or no, we have the document. They lied, the Lennar rep said, no it's not, when it was and he knew it was. I think he felt that um, they were gonna probably be penalized by HUD, but they would just have to pay the penalties. The more I researched, the more I started seeing a pattern with reports of uh, neighborhoods in Florida being built on top of bombs. Um, El Toro, um, they purchased that property and it has high levels of contamination. Um, Hunter's Point, uh, dealing with asbestos out there. Um, 
the list goes on and on and on. In the last 15 years of me doing accounting and investigative work, honestly, I've never heard of a general ledger being kept in the way that Lennar was keeping the general ledger. We were uh, first told to look into Lennar when a local bank and a client, a potential client had said, listen, I built this six, seven, eight hundred million dollar beautiful golf course in your area, San Diego. What I'm looking for are situations in which the company is potentially not being real forthcoming with their disclosures, where they may be technically following the accounting rules, but using those accounting rules to an extreme advantage to potentially cover up debt. From 1999 to 2006, a monkey in a zoo could have built a profitable construction project because real estate values were going through the roof, especially in Rancho Santa Fe. So he said, I went 50-50 partner with this Lennar Corporation. Money was transferred in and out. There were entries that were made and then reversed and then made again. And Lennar basically said between 99 and 06, no profits for you, no money. They wouldn't give them records. What you see is that Lennar takes these joint venture partners, leverages these deals to get as much cash as they can out of them, and then uses that cash to do other deals and potentially leaves the original deals cash poor and on the verge of collapse. And that is, in general terms, an absolute perfect example of how a Ponzi scheme works. You rob Peter to pay Paul, and then Peter eventually goes bankrupt or otherwise fails. It's really hard to believe that there's a balloon here at the former Marine Corps El Toro Air Station that's decorated like Halloween. It's being used to take people up and show them property that they'd like to sell them, that is, the Lennar Corporation would like to sell them on this heavily contaminated base. When we got wind of the contamination of this base and began our series of reports, uh, what we kept learning was even more incredible by the day. Dr. Bennett was the first chair of the Technical Advisory Committee for the rehab of the Marine Corps Air Station El Toro. I believe in the summer or early fall of 2000, he had supposedly, anyway, reported heart attack. Everyone was extremely distressed that not only had a man who seemed to be in perfectly good health suddenly dead, but that all of the documents he had in his garage, no one seemed to be able to find his family, but yet his family miraculously showed up, according to EPA, and uh, cleaned out his garage, and no one knows what happened to, to evidence. Chuck was the medical doctor. Secondly, he apparently had done a lot of studies and looked at an awful lot of hard copy information that led him to determine that the levels of uranium-235 were in concentrations that were far beyond what occurs in a natural state. Moreover, he noted the existence of all these volatile chemicals. El Toro is contaminated with trichloroethylene. It's in the groundwater, it's right below us, and it's in the aquifer systems, and also U-235 uranium, which is another problem out here. There are other compounds that are in the ground, benzene, PCE, and all these things are documented in the uh, Irvine Woodbridge Library. Where there's smoke, there's fire. There were too many things that he pointed out that were very alarming, that were extremely serious, including the radioactive material. That one blew everyone's mind. This was in concentrations that you'd only get if you had it in serious quantities like armament. At that time, they were actually coating a lot of the armament with radioactive materials. No one seemed to want to pursue a further investigation, perhaps an autopsy. Dr. Bennett was thought enough of, it was prestigious enough that they appointed him to this chairmanship, but yet all of the issues that he brought up nine years later have still not been fully addressed. This is the smoking gun. As of October 2007, this here is the border of the base, okay? This is the plume extending off of the base, clear over to where we were, okay? Different levels of TC, five times, ten times. Lennar is a major developer that's all over the United States. Their stock is tanked. I think they made a very bad investment with El Toro. There were so many aspects of this. We understand this base was worth over $10 billion in the assets that were all intact and functioning and operational. 
and, and centrally located. And it's just unbelievable. I joined the Marine Corps and after my overseas tour, I, I was uh, stationed as a security unit, guard unit. It was a known fact, guys would literally dig holes and pour solvents into those holes in the ground and cover them back up with dirt. But everything was soaking in and of course, you know, it's raining and everything else and soil, it is a what's called a clay expansive soil. That said, clay expansive soil puffs up and then shrinks depending on climatic conditions. Once it's wet, it's just a sponge. All those chemicals can then be transported. Several years ago, they had, con had thought about turning this into uh, an international airport, which would probably have been their best move, uh, but they chose not to do that. They chose to go with the residential and park businesses, public park for the kids. I think Lamar bought it for $659 million because it was relatively cheap and they thought that they could make a decent profit off of it. We had a, a property out here, 4,000 acres worth $10 billion, okay? It was bought for $650 million. In addition, it cost the Marines $2 billion to move down to Miramar and approximately $2 billion to move the Navy and the Top Gun School to Fallon, Nevada. They paid $650 million for $14 billion worth of U.S. taxpayers' travel costs and assets. It's about five cents on the dollar. The Irvine Company has said you couldn't give them the base. And I believe that. The thing is, the Irvine Company owns multiple thousands of acres around the base. If there's an airport there or a marine air base there, they have to develop that land under a commercial zone. They can make twice as much money to developing it in residential. And while this is taking place, thousands of marines are sick, they're dying, their children are sick, and they're trying to find their answers. And rather than having a level of responsibility out here, it seems like Lennar and the city of Irvine just simply want to make money and that there's nothing else to it and nothing, no, no red flags seem to be flying in their world. They're just moving forward as fast as they can. The illness is, I think, that it coming from this base, kidney and liver cancer, uh, bladder cancer, esophageal cancer, uh, leukemia, male and female breast cancer, birth defects, uh, the list is, 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 at this point is endless. It's up to the plaintiffs to band together to sue the, the, the developer of the land, the person who bought the land knowing that it's unsafe and who sells, sells it to people without informing that it's unsafe. And that, that person who sold the land is, is liable for having created a hazard. This is bad in all kinds of ways. One, military people uh, who serve their country exposed to this kind of uh, contamination from the TC in the ground, from the planes and the degreaser. But uh, how does a, a New York Stock Exchange public company second largest builder in the country, knowingly look at a, a, to construct a park with children in elementary schools and houses in ground contaminated by TCE. I mean, that's insane. From what I remember uh, being a kid, uh, we were coming into class every other day or every two or three days and, and the teachers were having to go around and wipe the desks off and, and uh, some misty chemical or uh, kind of a grayish black substance that was just, it looked like it was sprayed on lightly. They were having to wipe down the walls and the doors, uh, sinks, everything to get this stuff off of it. Every morning we'd come out at 8 o'clock for our lineup for the whole school and the principal would be talking and um, of course we had the noise pollution of the jets taking off right over there, up over our heads and at any given point he would stop in the middle of a sentence and we'd wait for the jets to go over and then he'd continue. So we're getting the inundation of the noise pollution, but at the same time, every morning on cue, if you were standing out there, your eyes would just stream. They, they would just stream, you could not control it. So Luann, we're trying to maybe hope to make some access onto this base. I think that uh, uh, my interest mainly is getting into my old squadron area, which is the contaminated zone of the base. And you wanted to go to the school because Tell me real quickly, but this is a place where you spent a lot of years. Right, I uh, taught there for seven years and I'm concerned now that perhaps they're going to level everything and I'd, I'd like to get some stills maybe of the uh, tree dedication for the child who died of leukemia right. while it still exists, so I'm really um, eager to get in yeah, before it's too late. And well, it's important, and, and as you said, this is going to be gone. The hangars are going to be gone too eventually, so it seems to me that uh, it would be reasonable for these guys to let us come up to the gate 
and just let us make some quick access. How are you? Good, and you? Good. Hi. Taking a picture of my dirty car. It's a beautiful car. It's dirty. <laughs> uh, I'm Tim King. I'm a reporter with Salem News. And this is Luann, and she was a teacher at the school. I was a Marine in the MWSG 37 area. Can we go down there and just take a look? We want to get some pictures and just, you know. Uh, you're not really supposed to be late taking pictures and stuff in here. And there's not really, you can't go that far. Yeah. We're just concerned that. Can we go that, up to um, the hangars? Would that be okay? Or? You can't get in them. Yeah. Would it be okay if we were just on the outside of them get, getting a few shots? We're, we're just worried that the school eventually will be leveled and there's um, a little tree that was dedicated to one of the students who died from leukemia and we're concerned that it's just going to be level and we won't be able to get any stills. The, um, the, Eltor, the old El Marine School out off of Pusan Way. Oh, did you go out there? It's all chain linked yeah. and there were signs so we didn't want to, you know, yeah. do it illegally. Right. We just hoped we could go over and get a couple stills of this tree and there's a plaque that has her name on it, a child who died from leukemia. We had several student deaths, so you know we just were concerned that it was going to be leveled, and that we wouldn't have the opportunity any longer to do that. Uh, I would say maybe go over to the headquarters on Tribuco if you want to get in there. Tribuco? Do we? Do you know where that is, Tim? Now we're entering the MWSG 37 area. This is Marine Wing Support Group. This is a support site of El Toro where we perform various operations to keep the jets flying, and. Um, this is the area that we refer to in our reports as ground zero because it's the most contaminated part of the base. What we're looking at right now is the MWSG 37 area. They're tearing up the top layer of concrete and uh, I'm sure just releasing mass amounts of contamination that's been partly held down by that. These workers, I'm sure, have no idea whatsoever what a toxic, dangerous place they're in. I really wonder what OSHA would say about this if they knew the extent of it. So I feel sorry for these workers tearing up the ground here at El Toro. This is Hangar 296. This was uh, Headquarters Squadron 37 of Marine Wing Support Group 37. This was where I was located. We'd come in here every day for work at 7.30, and I worked for a period of time in embarkation. Just That was preparing all of our stuff to go overseas to fight a war. I see that the hangar is still intact. My understanding is that this is a hangar, as well as the one next to it on the right, that they do not have permission to take these down right now because of the massive contamination of the ground. They're obviously trying to do things with it. We've, it's never clear to stand here and look at it to know what they're doing, except literally moving things around, moving piles of dirt, moving pieces of concrete, just all the massive uh, pieces of this base that are now lying in pure rubble. And look at the dirt and the dust coming off of that. And that poor driver is uh, breathing that stuff. All the people that are with us right now are complaining about their eyes stinging. And it's very consistent with what we used to experience as Marines here. There should be an FA-18 right there, getting ready to take off. There should be C-130s, there should be... I've talked with several Marine generals that they needed the base. There was no reduction in the uh, Marine air wings. There were no reduction in personnel. They needed the base. This is the old taxiway for the jets. It still has the uh, markings painted on the ground. And, uh, you know, this is where the action took place. This is where the jets were rumbling before takeoff. This base was so active, it was such a central, integral part of the Marine Corps' West Coast operation. In 1985, General Art Bloomer and Colonel John Robeson had a meeting with Donald Brand of the Irvine Company and uh, a guy named Gary Hunt from the Irvine Company. And in that meeting, Gary Hunt told General Bloomer and Colonel Robeson in front of Donald Brand that they would have the Marines out of El Toro by the year 2000. That was 15 years later. General Bloomer later told me that they didn't think that was possible. They kind of laughed it off. Well, sure enough, uh, July 1st, 1999, the Marines moved out of the base. The committee was in a state of stress because it was pretty obvious that these were things that were not only going to require difficulty, in removing, remediating, or mitigating, but moreover, very expensive. This is a building that was related to NBC. NBC is not a TV station. NBC is Nuclear Biological Chemical Warfare. We used to, at El Toro, have to wear these white suits with these full hoods and masks, and they'd make, them wear, make us wear them for hours. It made us believe that there was a nuclear or a, some kind of a contamination issue with this base. Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's the military talking or Lennar, home builders, if they say that they've addressed an issue and they have a piece of paper to prove it, 
um, they can tell the community we're good to go. We can build homes here. It's perfectly fine and clean and healthy and your family's going to love it here. Are they not caring what they're going to be doing to the potential families who are going to be living here or the children who are going to be playing in the parks uh, and, and risking their exposure to these chemicals? As far as I know, there was at least three students who died here, um, either leukemia or brain cancer. Um, there is a tree dedicated out and back to, if I have it correct, uh, Stephanie Castaneda and she died of a brain tumor, and we had a tree dedicating ceremony. We planted a tree, and there's a little plaque down at the base of the tree out in the backyard where the kids used to play. Then we read about Lennar worried that the government would not properly remediate, and they went to AIG. They pulled a $100 million oversight insurance policy on the Marine Corps Air Station out here at El Toro. To me, that says, even Lennar knows that they are, in fact, receiving damaged goods and are going to pass it along to the public. If I had a house that was over a major plume of trichloroethylene, 150 feet down, I would want to know if those vapors were permeating up through the soil and up through my foundation. And I would like a few houses tested just to make sure that there was no TCE vapor intrusion in those houses. I don't trust a word Lennar says at all. It's, it's not about people, it's about money. You're gonna cover things up and you're gonna expose them to poison and you're gonna kill them and pretend that it's not your fault. It's not okay. It's not okay on any level. The Marine I was talking about earlier, he was uh, from Camp Lejeune, uh, formerly an El Toro Marine. Uh, both he and his wife had suffered breast cancer. Uh, he had suffered uh, kidney and uh, bladder cancer. Uh, both his children had uh, uh, another form of cancer called leukemia. Uh, when I started to help him with his VA claim, uh, he had just lost his one daughter. The guy that you referenced with two kids, that's not <laughs> is it? Yeah. Dude, he and uh, he was my sergeant here at El Toro, so let's go over that. I know I he's at can't, I can't mention his name. Don't mention his name. I can't, I can't do that. No, no, no. But but I mean, can you just say that again? And because you just said Lejeune, he was an El Toro Marine also. Yeah. So can you just repeat that again about he's had breast cancer too? It's freaking epic. I just can't believe that we're even <clears throat> talking about this. I can't even believe that this individual who we're not using a name of. He... I can't talk about him. <laughs> Uh, when I called to follow up on him after his surgery, he asked me very politely, uh, please don't call him again. He had just lost his second daughter. What we found when we began to investigate Lennar is a pattern of behavior where not just hundreds, but thousands of people have been materially adversely impacted by this company. And either what I'm saying is true, and if it's true, you have to ask yourself, how could it be in a post-Madoff, post-subprime mortgage, post-Enron environment, that a New York Stock Exchange company could do so much damage to the public? And I moved to San Francisco in 1950. And at that time, uh, the war was going on in Korea. And of course, they were bringing, uh, you know, ships in here to be redone. African Americans were recruited here by the War Department, by the military. And when the war ended, they thought African Americans were going to go back to Texas, go back to Louisiana, go back to Oklahoma and Arkansas. But when we stayed, uh, the Navy, the city, the planners were trying to figure out what to do with this unwanted, undesirable population. Black people are dying of cancer, asthma, bronchitis. And there were black people from this poor telling the EPA, you don't have to worry, everything is fine for black people and their health out there in Hunter's Point. A lot of activity was going on I didn't know anything about. Because at that time they had a uh, uh, radiological lab here that uh, testing of, uh, you know, uh, bombs. They'd have 
ships out there and then, they, you know, and submarines. And of course, when they got ready to clean them up, they brought them to Baby Runners Point. We've been exposed to, to an, an unprecedented level of asbestos exposures, as well as other toxins, from a shipyard that's a Superfund site. What I think that Lennar was banking on was that the community would not be educated enough to know about asbestos and its impact. We have to wait for people to, you know, to die, and uh, that's one of the reasons why the situation is dragging on. All of that uh, material from the ships, everything was bad and went to the Baby Hunters Point shipyard. Lennar promised to monitor the health uh, exposures as it related to the uh, dust and the grading and development activities in the shipyard, which is one of the most toxic sites anywhere in the country. The symptoms of asbestos exposure can be very, very vague uh, and can take a long time uh, to surface. Uh, what's more important than the asbestos exposure is the exposure to toxic dust because people who are exposed to the tiny, tiny particulate uh, can have the onset of symptoms very immediately. There's some studies that show that when people are exposed to particulates uh, in the air, that it can uh, trigger the onset of asthma attacks and heart attacks uh, within about 24 to 48 hours. This came straight from the Navy, that the Navy actually had knowledge of asbestos and the damage that it would do 30 years before I even got to work, started working there. Not 10, not five, but 30 years long enough to know the kind of damage that asbestos does to the body. Lenore, as a corporation or anybody who works for them, should not be able to sleep at night knowing that somebody's children or grandchildren, you know, are going to develop a disease in their adulthood. And the impact that asbestos poisoning has, because it's so tricky, because it cannot be diagnosed immediately, um, they're thinking that they could get away with murder. See, you're dealing with liars, thieves, and hirelings. Most of these people don't give a damn about their people because if they did, they would challenge the lie based upon the history of redevelopment. Mayor Newsom in the Fillmore District, Lenar and cities all over this country have lied to communities, bankrupted communities, poison community, and we're supposed to believe they're going to do different in Bayview Hunters Point? Give me a damn break. San Francisco Department of Public Health issued at least three notices of violation uh, to Lennar Corporation, but fell short of uh, demanding a, a, a complete shutdown of construction activities. And the health department admits we were exposed but has to this day never stopped Lennar for one day from working out there and continuing that exposure. So we have now uh, a fight on our hands. Right now we have a case by, by a number of plaintiffs. If you want to see it, you can go right down to City Hall. It's a, a filed lawsuit um, against Lennar Corporation um, for um, uh, racism, um, for uh, polluting the environment. Um, and specifically causing harm to the individual plaintiffs in the case. The title of the first story that we, that we ran about um, the activities of Lenar was called The Corporation at 8 San Francisco. You know, I kind of went down the rabbit hole of research and mapping out who this operation is, how it began in Florida in the 50s, and grew and grew and grew, and eventually I think has operations in over 20 states, and how it came to California, and, and why, which was because we were having a boom, in a real estate boom. When the military bases began to be released, that developers all across the country saw this as a, as a huge opportunity. Here were areas of industrial land that were either undeveloped or underdeveloped, you know, nothing much had happened to them. And I think right now, Lenar has control of over 770 acres in San Francisco. Well, you don't usually find what, that's almost the size of a small town, like, you know. You don't usually find areas of land like that lying around, and especially not in a peninsula like San Francisco where every last inch is, you know, is occupied and fought. fierce battles go on to do anything suddenly you have this area. So they were looking at those areas and they were collecting them. Mare Island, Hunters Point, 
Treasure Island. It's all over the country what's going on here in San Francisco. The only other place that a land grab was larger than San Francisco. And we haven't had no hurricane, not even an earthquake for 20 years. But the largest land grab in this country, New Orleans and San Francisco was second. All we do is supposed to build 1,600 hours. That's three and a half years ago. There's not one pad out there. And you hear a lot of things as a reporter. People are constantly making allegations, so we look into them. And what we were able to find was a pattern of broken promises, definitely on the environmental monitoring of the asbestos, both you know in the air monitoring and the, the watering. We found um, patterns of changing the, the original plan, like whether you're going to build rental housing or condos whether you're going to build 32% of, of affordable housing or whether you're only going to build 32% in certain areas. And it, it goes on. Lennar's track record doesn't live up to the promises. Lennar started promising this community a legacy fund of $31 million and reneged on it. Lennar promised affordable rental housing for this community and reneged on it. Lennar and the city wants to build condominiums and even a football stadium. So at the expense of this community's health and to fast track this project, Lennar agreed and sold the community on the idea that they were going to monitor the health of this community and monitor the dust and monitor the air out there. And from the very beginning of this development and the grading out there, Lennart uh, purposely, with intent, uh, did not monitor that dust out there. And so for nearly a year, this community was exposed to thick dust plumes of asbestos and other toxins. And to this day, uh, Lennar has kept digging and with the city's blessing because the whole aim was to fast track this project by any means necessary. In the fall of 2006, I started to hear a lot of concerns being raised, allegations that asbestos dust was being, you know, released all over the Bayview, which is obviously kind of a scary thought. Wow, here's a school. Uh, it was a, it's a K through 12 school um, that teaches um, kids from all over the Bay Area. Many of them are color. It's, it's run by the Nation of Islam. The city tried to get them to move instead of stopping them off from pointing the kids where they're at. You know, we got several schools around uh, uh, the shipyard. Don't keep the kids inside all the time. Come on. They got to get out there. They got to run. They got to jump. They got to play. That's what vitalizes their bodies and their minds. Yet we're taking that at a risk because we don't know what's going on here. The thing that really struck me was there's a chain link fence and that's all that stands between it and the playground. So there were children kind of hopping, skipping, jumping on this playground. And on the other side, there were big heavy equipment that was digging and grading this hillside. And this was where the asbestos was allegedly being released. The Superfund site from the school would be about 25 feet because truly the entire area was contaminated with not just asbestos, but with heavy metals, radioactive elements. There's all kind of things in the soil itself. They were being exposed, even though Proposition 65 is a law in California that you have to warn people when you're potentially exposing them to toxins that are cancer-causing. Yet, Lennar violated all of those principles. This fence with this tarping is what they call protection. The mesh screening, we're still trying to figure it out because everybody knows that when the wind picks up dirt, it doesn't throw it to your ankles, it whips it up in the air, so the fence itself really is too low. It's mesh with holes to it. Asbestos fibers are so small that it literally takes a special piece of equipment just to see a fraction of a, of a fiber. 
a mesh screen is just what it is. Mesh, it has holes, it's very porous. Back in high school when I was a senior, I uh, contracted asthma and that stopped me from doing my homework because I was living most of the time inside the hospital with asthma and skin irritations, bloody noses. Um, my grade dropped from a 4.0 student down to a 1.68. The asbestos doesn't normally cause nosebleeds, but we do know that the antimony does. We do know that the mercury and the lead in here does. We know for a fact is that, yes, there is a naturally occurring asbestos rock. As long as you're not messing with it, no problem. Until you start chipping into it. They weren't chipping, they were grinding. They were making it into a powder. My research found an email exchanges where it seemed that the developer didn't feel that it had to install monitors and then somebody at the Air District was like, well, no, there's a school right on the other side. Yeah, there's a school there. After they were made aware by the, actually by the Air District, who actually started noting and, by, and, and citing them, actual citations, you know, your monitor's not in place. They put monitors out. What was the point in putting the monitors out if well, we don't even know how long before you actually, oh, forgot to put a battery in them. Lenar was fine. Uh, for violating the Air Quality Act. They were fined $516,000. The unfortunate thing is that they were fined $516,000 for 380 some odd days worth of non-monitoring. The Air District has the ability to fine them up to $25,000 a day, but that's like a slap on the hand. One of the things I found in the files was in an official for Lenar saying every day that we shut down the work site costs us $40,000. So then if you take the amount of days that they didn't shut down and think that it didn't cost them $40,000 every day and you, you, you add all that up, suddenly that half million dollar fine doesn't seem so much. They agreed to pay the fine as long as they didn't have to admit that they did wrong. No, Lenar Corporation did not pay uh, for the property. Uh, the city and county of San Francisco uh, had to pay a dollar uh, for the property. Lenar got the property for free. <laughs> Don't get paid. Don't get paid. Well, there is, they only put water here when somebody's around is around or somebody's going to come mm -hmm. into the neighborhood yeah. but other than that they don't they don't cover their dirt even when they're moving dirt you're supposed to be doing a job in there keeping the, the dirt down with water but they're not even doing that in california uh, developers are required to mitigate they're required to to wet down the soil so the uh, dust doesn't get in the air and so people can't be breathing asbestos fibers Unfortunately, that's an OSHA standard for the workers who are working on site. It is not an uh, air quality standard regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States. Uh, so if you're a worker working on Lennar bulldozing, you are given a badge. And it's a, like a radiation badge. It records cumulative impacts of asbestos, and once you reach more than so many thousand fibers, you're not allowed to work there anymore because that's considered to be hazardous to your health. Um, that limit does not apply to residents who may live next to it. They can be exposed to it and there's no law against it. You may or may not be aware of the fact that on October the 13th, 2009, there was an asbestos level at HV 11, one of the community monitors of 400,000 structures uh, per cubic centimeter. And again, the shutdown level is 16,000 structures per cubic centimeter and the mitigation level is 1,600. This was 400,000. So these are you know, the levels of exceedance. You would expect that it would be newsworthy, that people are continuing to be chronically exposed to toxic dust. We know there's asbestos in the dust. We also know that there are other substances that are not being talked about. My principal concern is lead. NAR funded uh, last year a big uh, measure called Prop G to redevelop the shipyard and put 10,500 units of housing on one of the most toxic 
nuclear dumps in the nation. Uh, the only thing really saving our lives and have kept us alive is the fact is of the ocean that most of the time the wind comes from the ocean and blows it away. So actually to tell you the truth, God been taking care of us. This certainly have not been the city. You know, I don't think any of this is um, hysterical hearsay. And I think that the problem with um, uh, being a minority community is that people have a tendency to say it's hysterical hearsay. It's not true, you don't have the statistics. But when we had the real statistics done, a lot of them were not even disclosed. They were so devastating. One can say that definitely, you know, it's not good to have dust that's not being controlled on a project. And people will say, and you know, within that community, this would never happen in Pacific Heights. You know, this would never happen if it was the area where, you know, our top elected officials live. And if it did happen, certainly something would happen that would be, you know, more of a more than just a slap on the wrist. It's been a, a very upsetting um, experience working for people who have been victims of that asbestos, of the thick uh, sand and dust that uh, ends up on their heads and their, in their lungs, through their nose, through their ears. I mean, really upsetting. I mean, you know, I'm a discrimination lawyer. Um, I, I, I live on comparisons, all right? Give me a neighborhood like that where building went on, where they didn't clean it up immediately. Show me one. Las Vegas, there are all sorts of new development areas, okay? You're not gonna find one where they didn't clean it up properly. You're not gonna find one with community outrage because there's asbestos in the, in the air. You're not gonna find one. The one you will find is Baby Hunter's Point. Lennar has promised a lot of money, has bought a lot of public officials, community leaders, preachers, organizations with promises, and some have gotten resources to push this project forward. There's a history of the negation and the destruction of the health of the poor people in Hunter's Point, and this is the 21st century version of that 70-year legacy. So you've got an environmental catastrophe, you've got criminalization policies that are being implemented, all that's happening based upon this Lennar shipyard development. So we've got a serious fight on our hands. Fraud is not a problem that can be legislated away. It's a problem that has to be addressed from within the company. Because when something is morally against who you are and you're participating in it every day, it grinds away at you. There has to be an ethical culture within the company that is created and demanded by shareholders and those to whom the companies are responsible. Well, the American dream was great when you were dealing with Joe, who was down the street. You knew him. He was a good builder. He had grown up and knew how to, to put things together. He, he had good carpenters, good crews. He cared about you. He was responsible. He had insurance policies or gave you a bond. He had something to fall back on. And he's one of your local folks that you knew would do you a good job. Everything worked fine. But when the housing industry became a cookie cutter industry, and we started developing subdivisions of 500 to 1,000 homes all at once, with crews that were not qualified, with materials that were not suitable. And we started cutting costs, and we did that just to sell a product, then the entire home building situation collapsed. And so the American dream, I'm sorry to say, in my opinion, may have collapsed with it. Well, as a pastor, I'm, first of all, I'm not a very good one, so th that helps. There's a moral imperative here with Lennar, uh, so as a pastor, I feel like that needs to, but I don't bash Lennar from the pulpit. As a pastor, I hope they would just own up to what they did and take responsibility for it. I'd be their biggest cheerleader. They have 538 lawsuits 
that they're involved in, most of which of them being sued. Most of those are over 250,000. That's not an average builder overflowed toilet bed. That's crazy. There's something wrong there. I always say to my congregation, I'm a liar and a thief saved by God's grace. I don't judge nobody and uh, I'm saved by grace alone through faith alone and I'm thankful. However, 